that begins is a heart full of love. Let's bow our heads in prayer as we approach God's throne of grace this morning and as we prepare our hearts for his word. Dear God and ever loving Father, we thank you that you are a God who is filled with grace and truth. This morning we embrace your grace. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for your shed blood. We thank you for your demonstration of love. It's our prayer today, Lord God, that we will not frustrate that grace, that we will not abuse that grace. We will not continue in sin so that grace may abound. But we will understand that we are your workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We will balance the grace of God with the truth of God, with the requirements of God, even with the judgment of God. And help us, Lord God, to extend that grace to others, even now as your Holy Spirit ministers to us. We pray for those who are brokenhearted and bruised because of some in perceived injustice that they might have experienced in some relationship that have gone sour. Lord God, your grace is sufficient even in those times. Even when it's like a thorn in the flesh that wouldn't go away, a prick that constantly penetrates and wounds, I pray, God, that your grace will indeed be sufficient to cause us, Lord God, to forget those things that are behind and press on to what's before, to recognize that you have a high call upon our lives, but that call can be found not in the pains of the past, but in the purpose of the future that is found in Christ Jesus. Today, let your word stimulate our faith. We submit our lives to you. We submit our minds. We humble ourselves before you, acknowledging you as our source, as our God, as the author and the finisher of our faith. And help us, Lord, to receive with meekness the engrafted word of God that is able to bring peace and salvation and wholeness to our souls. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say, Amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Thank you. I want to welcome you again this morning. And <clears throat> some weeks ago, we looked at Psalms chapter 27 and we saw how the psalmist, like all of us, experienced a mixture of blessings and battles in life. He faced fears, he faced slander, he faced adversity. He faced broken relationships, but he was able to be victorious in all because of his attitude and because of his relationship with God, whom he saw to be his light and salvation in the midst of his crisis. Last week, Madonna Doyle spoke to us very powerfully about faith, and she looked at Sarah's faith. And God's ability to perform humanly impossible feats in our lives. Today I want to refer you to a passage of scripture whereby the Apostle Paul clearly states that we are engaged in spiritual warfare. I want you to look at neighbor and say we are engaged in a battle. We are indeed engaged in spiritual warfare. The Bible tells us that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God. There is a spiritual warfare that takes place and we are engaged in it. Whether or not you fight, you are still in the battle. However, God has equipped us with weaponry which enables us to stand against the wiles of the devil, to stand against principalities, to stand against powers. To stand against the rulers of darkness of this world. To stand against spiritual wickedness in high places. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 to 18. The apostle Paul says, Finally my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, 
having done all to stand and have stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace above all taking the shield of faith where it you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of god praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereon too with all perseverance and supplication for all saints so here we see that we are equipped to withstand in the evil day but we must stand taking unto us the whole armor of god even though we are on the winning side we can become prisoners of this war even though we are on the winning side we can become war fatalities if we don't allow ourselves to be liberated by the spirit of god we will be imprisoned by the enemy and that is why it's important that we use the tools and strategies given to us by our commander-in-chief we will always be victorious through jesus christ and there's several scriptures that remind us of this romans chapter 8 verse 31 if god be for us then who can be against us in other words if god is standing for you who could stand up against you now they could be against you but they wouldn't win it goes on to talk about who can accuse us it goes on to say that nothing can separate us from the love of christ it doesn't matter what situation you're going through it doesn't matter what trial you're facing it doesn't matter what opposition you are you're coming up against nothing can separate us from the love of god in first corinthians 15 57 it says but thanks be to god which giveth us the victory through our lord jesus christ so you are given the victory it sounds as if the competition is rigged you are given the victory we have already been he has already won and he has given us the victory it reminds me again of an analogy that i learned from shambak who's an old evangelist and i'm sure i would have shared it with you when he talked about these boxes in a ring and the boxer getting all the licks and getting all the beating and so on and then he wins and he becomes the champion and he wins a million dollars he's a champion he's a conqueror he fought and he won but his wife who stays home and puts her foot up on the poof and eats popcorn and watches the game on television and spends the million dollars is more than a conqueror jesus is the conqueror but we are more than conquerors because he has given us the victory that he won i'm going to say another joke but women might not like it but it's not original so i wouldn't take the stones you know one of our speakers who are doing it finances his wife is a homemaker and he says Mar marriage is a workshop i work and she shops he said i told you the woman wouldn't like it i took a risk there <laughs> in second corinthians 2 14 it says now thanks be unto god which always causes us to triumph everybody say always causes us to triumph always. say it again until you believe it so it means it doesn't matter what you're experiencing you may have a debt in your family you may have just lost your job you may have been dealing with sickness you may have a major disappointment somebody may be slandering your name and you may be facing a court court matter thanks be unto god not thanks for the situation thanks be unto god who always everybody said always, always. causes us to triumph in christ and make it manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place first four, john 5 5 says who is he that overcometh the world 
he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. A war is seldom won or lost in a single battle. So even though you might experience some kind of bruising in some of your battles, it does not mean that you have lost the war. So regardless of how difficult the situation may seem, the text indicates that we, if we appropriate the armor of God in our lives, we will win. Give God some praise. I don't know the details of all that, that you all are facing. I know some of some of you. I don't know the details of what you are about to face. Somebody said, if you, you don't have a problem, if you, never, if you didn't have a problem, maybe you are having one. And if you didn't have a problem and you're not having one, it's because you're soon to have one. <laughs> it is what the senior citizens used to say, what a meet you, a pass you. But what I'm saying to you this morning is regardless of what meets you or passes you, in every situation, you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. You know, what are the results of allowing God to fight your battle? In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, we have a perfect illustration of how God fights for, for those who are devoted to him. Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, found himself in a very dangerous position. The Moabites and the Ammonites were coming to battle against the children of Israel. Jehoshaphat didn't know what to do. The opposing forces were more than his resources. So he said, Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. In other words, Lord, this is, I don't know if you are in a situation that is too much for you to handle. And we don't want to be, you know, naive. The Bible says God is faithful. He will not allow us to be tested more than we are able to bear. But will with the temptation provides a means of escape so that we'll be able to bear it. That does not mean that we will never face a situation that we cannot bear. That does not mean that we'll never face a situation that is too difficult for us to handle. What it does mean is that in every situation, God will equip us to handle it. So don't be naive and rock your shoulder and say, you know, it's not a thing that I, I can't handle. No, it has nothing that you and God can't handle. It is God who is faithful. And he will not allow you to be tempted more than you are able to bear. Because he will with the temptation. <laughs> not without. Sometimes we like it that way. He will with the temptation provide a way of escape. So that you will be able to bear it. My friends, there are some circumstances in life you will not be able to bear without him. So when somebody comes to me in counseling and they say, Pastor, this is too much, I can't take it. I am out of place to tell them, yes, you could take it. Because it's them who get in it, it's not me. What I have to tell them is, yes, boy, it's true. You really can't take it. This thing really hard. But God is able. God is able. Let's pray. How could we support you? Because there's some situations, even I, I don't have the resources to help as much as you care. And that's the difference between sympathy and compassion. Sympathy, people feel sorry for you. But when you have compassion, you do something about it. <laughs> Jesus never had sympathy. Jesus was moved with compassion. But sometimes, all we could offer is sympathy. Are you with me? What can I do for you if your mother dies, besides giving her a free funeral? What can I do for you if your spouse dies? 
besides helping you go through and and helping you understand what you have to do and all the different complications and giving advice and prayer holding your hand give support be a listening ear but that is not going to soothe your loneliness in the night when you're going through the grocery and you have to buy less i went through that with my own mother i used to shop for my mother every week and after she died, we were going to the grocery and watching Enshaw, watching adult pampers, and I don't have to buy it again. And simple chores like that brought back memories, created emptiness, stimulated pain. So don't, don't be naive and feel that, you know, you accept Jesus Christ and you just live happily ever after. We are in a war. We are in a war. The Apostle Paul had a situation and he prayed for it three times. Three times he prayed for it and he didn't get any relief. He prayed and he did not get relief. He goes to God and he says, God, what's going on? You forget, boy, you don't hear what? It is. Everybody getting through. I prayed for people and they're getting healed. I preach and people getting saved. What, is, what are you doing with your boy? Oh, go on, man. <laughs> and God says, even though I say no to that, don't worry. Because my strength is perfected in your weakness. And my grace is sufficient for you. I didn't say I'm going to say abracadabra, we foot and solve the problems the way you want it solved. But what I would say is that I will never leave you nor forsake you. And I will carry you when you can bear it. I will hold you up with my right hand. And you will survive the storm that you will survive. You'll be surprised the storm you will be able to survive with me. Don't believe the fallacy that because you're Christian, you're immune to challenges in life. So Jehoshaphat was faced with opposing forces that were greater than his resources. And he looked up. He called a fast for the people. And they went to the house of the Lord. And then the people began to remind themselves of who God was. And that's why it's very important to keep coming to church. The psalmist says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord. He said that in Psalms chapter 27, which we preached a couple of days ago, a couple of weeks ago. He says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord. You know why I want to go in the house of the Lord? Because I want to behold his beauty. I just want to think about the goodness of the Lord. When I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he picked me up, how he turned me around, how he planted my feet on higher ground. When I think about who God is, I need, I need to rush away from the, from the business and the, of, of the hectic chores and schedule. I need to just pull away from, from the three jobs that are doing to try to make ends meet. I need to just come to a place where I could just behold the beauty of the Lord. Amen. That's what they did. They're facing opposition on any side. Pressure from all sides. Pressure on the job. Pressure home. Pressure in your relationship. Pressure in your finances. Your creditors calling you. Pressure on every side. You need to come apart and rest a while. And that's why some people are going crazy. And dying from all kinds of stress related illnesses. Because they wouldn't take time off. From trying to deal with the stress themselves. And rest in God. Come aside. Come aside. So they come and they remind themselves of who God was. And then they made the request known to God by the petition of their prayers. And then they began to sing and worship God. Doesn't it sound like our church? <laughs> we do that all the time. Praise, prayer, and word. Praise, prayer, and word. Praise, prayer, and word. That's treating you sure to get when you come here. In any service. Ain't true? <laughs> That's how church is designed. 
I get a, I get a template from the word. So they began to sing. And the victory was great for them. Israel never actually advanced into battle position you know, in, in, in that chapter. 2 Chronicles 20. And the reason why they never advanced into real battle position is because God fought their battle for them. It comes just like Joshua. We're coming to take over Jericho. The first time they come, I could see people standing on the walls of the city with their arrows drawn waiting for the attack. And they just march around silently in obedience to God. And they repeated that for six days. So by this time, the people say, well, this is a silent march. But on the seventh day, when they gave a shout of praise, the walls of the city that was impenetrable came tumbling down. God secures the victory. God fought their battle for them. And these were the results of, of, of relying upon God to fight the battle. When you allow God to fight your battle, you don't have to fight. In 2 Chronicles 20, 22, it says, And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushments. The Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which will come against Judah, and they were smitten. The Lord did it. The Lord did it. Amen. When we were younger, in ICF days, we used to sing a song, Jesus be a fence. All around me, every day. Lord, I want you to protect me. Fight my battles while I stand still. I know you can. Yes, Lord. I know you will. Yes, Lord. Fight my battles while I stand still. Jesus, be a fence all around me every day. When the Lord is fighting a battle, you don't have to fight. So stop cussing up your neighbor. Stop beating up and getting on bad. Your attitude is not changing that man. As a matter of fact, it's making a bad situation worse. Another effect is that you get total victory. I don't know of any enemies. I'm not aware of any enemies that I have. But if I have any enemies, I rather God deal with them than me. Because when he does a job, he does a proper job. He's not like some tradesmen we know. I don't know why you're clapping for that. <laughs> like that fall in somebody's garden. Somebody have a problem with somebody. <laughs> he does a proper job. He does what I cannot do. God gives total victory. When the battle is over, all the enemies are defeated and dead. And none shall escape. Tell somebody, none shall escape. escape. Don't play with my God. And when Judah came toward the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked unto the multitude. And where all these armies that come against us, boy? Everybody dead. Everybody. There were dead bodies fallen to the earth. And none escaped. That is power. That is awesomeness. You could play with me, but don't play with God. It's like when you're small in school and you're meeting a bully, I go, bring me big brother for you. I go, bring me, my father's a policeman. My daddy big and strong. My daddy's stronger than you. My daddy's stronger than your daddy. Yes, my daddy's stronger than my, your daddy. My daddy's so big, so strong, so mighty. There's nothing that my daddy cannot do. Betty Goatee. <laughs> Tell the devil that. Tell the devil that. He afraid you. 
you go and hide behind your daddy's foot. Make big talk and run behind your daddy and hide. The battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. So when you allow God to fight, you don't have to fight. When you allow God to fight, you get total victory. And after the victory, you get the rewards. All of the spoils belong to the soldiers, undivided. Second Chronicles 20, 25. And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoil of them, they found among them in abundance. Somebody say abundance. You see, my God will give you enough. No, my God will give you more than enough. You want to know where I get that? I get that from Ephesians 3.20. But unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or think. So God, doesn't, God is not just able to do what you ask. God is able to do all that you ask. And he's not just able to do all that you ask. He's able to do above all that you ask. And he's not just able to do above all that you ask. He's able to do abundantly above all that you can ask. And he's not just able to do abundantly above all that you ask. He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or think. Even beyond your wildest fantasies, our God is able. So look what happened here. They took away the spoil. They found among them in abundance both riches with the dead bodies and precious jewels. So they found both riches and precious jewels in abundance which they stripped off for themselves. More than they could carry away. And man, it took them three days to gather the spoils. It was so much. It was so much. Some of us be struggling with the concept of tithing. Is that you believe God or you don't? And Malachi 3.10 says that, Prove me in this and see if I will not pour you out a blessing where there will not even room enough, not even room enough to contain more than you could carry away. God gives abundant rewards when you allow him to fight your battle. And as a result, guess what happened? The soldier has a reason to celebrate. Jesus talks to us about praying. So that our joy will be filled. When you get your prayer answered, it's time to dance. Now people have different ways of responding to different things. But I don't know, when you're happy and you're glad... Is a skipping, is a jumping, is a spinning, is a turning around. I remember when, when I was young and I was looking for a job. And you're writing people, writing people, writing people, and nobody answering. And some people saying everything on fire. And then somebody calls you and they tell you so and so, and this is the package and so and so. I get up and I dance all by myself. No music, nothing. Nobody in the room. Just me alone on the phone. Dance and spin around. But it was for nothing. <laughs> Somebody wanted me to sell things and they always promise you a big package. So, that's not me. Other people could do those things. I could only sell what I believe in. That's why I'm a preacher. <laughs> I, don't, I can't force things. People, don't, people throw it because I need a commission at the end of the month. I don't have that stamina. But it's just me. It's just me. It's just me. Nothing wrong with people who do that. Everybody has their gift. And some people could take more risk. Uh, have a greater propensity for risk than others. So, the soldiers had a reason to celebrate. When you look at Second Chronicles 20, 26 to 28. And on the fourth day, because they take three days to gather the spoil, it was more than enough. And on the fourth day, they assembled themselves in the in the valley of Baraka. For there, they did what? They blessed the Lord. That's why, you know, when people celebrate, they have a Thanksgiving. You don't just have a party. You have a Thanksgiving and you party after. <laughs> yes, bless the Lord. 
Bless the Lord. When I was 21 years old, I had a Thanksgiving in my house, in my mother's house. <laughs> Give thanks. Major events in your life, major victory in your life. Call people together and bless the Lord. So they celebrated by blessing the Lord. I'm trying to remember. I preached something and I can't remember if I preached it here. Yes, I preached it here. The attitude of gratitude. Yes. And how, and how, what is it? Okay. And how, um, and how the guy came back and he thanked God and while the others were just healed he was made whole so you need to come back and bless the Lord you need to come back and, and, and say thanks you need to come back and celebrate I like music and dancing you know? I don't know about you and as for my wife she had back well at all She had back well at all, at all, at all. Then they returned every man of Judah and Jerusalem and Jehoshaphat in the forefront of them, the leader was in front, to go again to Jerusalem with joy. She said, going home with joy. Why? For the Lord had made them to rejoice over the enemy weeping i know you're weeping right now i know you're going through a dark valley i know you're going through probably what you think is the valley of the shadow of death but weeping may endure for a night but joy comes in the morning i know one songwriter he tried to hasten that he said morning comes whenever you wake up so wake up wake up wake up and they came to jerusalem with salt trees and harps music some people don't want music in the church i love music and i love musical instruments and i love all kind of music some more than others some styles you can only take one song <laughs> you can't take too, too, too much but all kind of music all kind of instruments into the house of the lord you see, we have a pan in the house of the Lord. It doesn't matter if people just use that for, for carnival and, and for, for things. We ain't using it for that. We're using it to celebrate and to celebrate Jesus. And to celebrate the victory that he has won for us. So these are the results of allowing God to fight your battles. You don't have to fight the battle. God gives you total victory. God gives abundant rewards. And you have a reason to celebrate. But also, God gives you rest. How many could do that good rest? Not now, eh? Wake up. <laughs> now is morning time. Morning is when you wake up. But I'm talking about a rest from the struggle. A rest from the fight. A rest from the stress. Huh? God gives rest. Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Yes. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light, and you'll find rest for your soul. You see, when the soul is at rest, it's a deeper rest than when the body is at rest. Because sometimes you lie down in your bed and your mind tormented. Where is child? When she coming home? What is man doing out so late? Oh God, why go get many? They're going to call tomorrow for that pay. And I have it yet. And you're there, you're tossing and you're turning your body lie down, you know. But your soul is not at rest. When you come unto him, you get rest for your soul. Emotions and mind is at peace. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, with prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your heart and mind by Christ Jesus. So that's more bonus. Like plenty bonus. Not only do you get complete victory, 
not only do you get more rewards than you could carry you get a reason to celebrate joy unspeakable and full of glory and the half has not yet been told and then you get a peace that passes all understanding man that is a package how you could refuse that and choose to fight and beat up yourself like a headless chicken these are the results of the battle but what are the requirements for this victory this victory is sweet but what are the requirements for this victory with all the biblical examples that have been provided to gain victory we have to fulfill the requirements of God for the soldier to really experience the victory that has been provided for him he must utilize the whole armor of God the armor has to be used in every battle every day truth or sincerity is the girdle the girdle is the foundation garment that holds all the other garments in place that's a very important strap sincerity truthfulness commitment readiness preparation is the belt which has to be worn the righteousness of christ breastplate of righteousness the righteousness of christ that is imputed to us fortifies the heart against the attacks of satan the greaves to protect the feet your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace armor for your legs to stand your ground or to march forward in rugged terrain terrain the feet must be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace that's that gospel of peace is confidence in god confidence in god gives you peace salvation must be our helmet the helmet of salvation and that is a good hope of salvation a scriptural expectation of victory which purifies the soul and keeps it from being defiled by satan yet there is another valuable piece of armor that also must be worn and that is the shield of faith the shield of faith is a very important aspect of our battle gear the shield of faith is important because the bible states that it has the ability to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and that is why we want to spend some time the rest of our time discussing that today and i'm saying it's not that it's the most important one but for this kind of discussion we could only deal with one at a time when we go into this kind of depth as a matter of fact we're going to deal with one two times because this sermon is going to be split in two faith is very important faith is an absolute necessity last week um madonna referred us to hebrews chapter 11 it says in verse 6 without faith it's impossible to please god for he who comes to god must first believe that god is that is that god exists and that god is the rewarder of them who diligently seek him so faith is not just a priority faith is an imperative because without it you can't please god at all without it really you you have no hope and then the bible says it is by grace we are saved in ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 onward it is by grace we are saved through faith not of works lest any man should boast it is a gift of god so without faith you're not going to be saved without faith you're not going to be born again and now that you're born again and you're justified the bible tells us at least in two places that the just must live by faith so even as a justified person even as a born again believer your lifestyle has to be one that is based on faith and then first john chapter 5 verse 4 says 
whatsoever is born of God, again, those of us who have been justified by faith, overcomes the world. If you have a whole world of opposition, you'll be able to overcome it. But this is a victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Shambach used to say, you don't have any trouble. All you need is faith in God. Of course, you do have trouble. <laughs> but to deal with your trouble, you need faith in God. What he's saying is that the trouble are no trouble when you have faith in God. Because there is a solution to the problem. So that's why we need to spend some time on this whole issue of faith. The scripture says, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. The shield was a very important part of the weaponry that the soldier had on his body. There were several types of shield that were used throughout the history by soldiers. First, there was a small rounded shield that was tapered at the edges and strapped to the to the forearm it was very a very mobile uh, piece of equipment yet it was not the choice shield for soldiers to use it was constructed of wicker that had been convert covered with leather and the greek word for that particular type of shield is aspis this shield was useless against the arrows because the aspis would be burned with fire. So unless special measures were taken, these shields could greatly endanger the life of the soldier when he embarked in battle. So not every shield protects you adequately. So the shield that, that was preferred and the shield that, that, that um, or the style of, of armor that the Apostle Paul would most have likely been referring to was a second type of shield that was very prevalent. It was about 52 inches, that means four and a half feet, by 30 inches, about two and a half feet. It was door shaped and made of wood, leather, and metal. In the latter times, the, the shield was framed and contained bosses, which, were, which bosses are raised parts. Or, or protruding ornaments ornaments on, on the surface the greek name for this shield is tarion and it originates from the root word thura which is door this is a particular shield that paul was referring to when he was writing to the church at ephesus this shield was was made of, of several layers of leather that was soaked in water before the battle the fiery arrows would be deflected away from the soldier who was fighting in the battle. I've read that in the days of the Romans, the soldiers were smaller than what people are today. And this was advantageous. Because the soldier could obviously get down behind the shield and his entire body would be totally protected. So the Romans incorporated the shield into their battle plans and their strategy. A line of men would, could, could advance with shields in front of the troops. And behind the shield bearers would come with archers and spearmen and other members of the infantry. And when the shield bearers had gotten to the point of the battle, they would embed the shields into the ground, which would provide a wall to face the incoming enemy. And these shields would also be advanced as the enemy gave up ground. And advancing of the shields would culminate with the battle ending in the final efforts of hand-to-hand -hand combat. Paul wrote to the Ephesian church, above all, take, take the shield of faith. Now, this does not mean that the shield was the most important portion of the armor, as I tried to indicate before. Each piece of the armor is essentially overlapping of the other. So, everyone is important. Every piece of armor is essential to the safety of the believer. Paul is exhorting in addition to. 
when he says above all he doesn't mean that this is most important he means in addition to he means on top of are you following on top of that i want you to do so and so i want you to do so 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 but on top of that i want you to do this i want you to take the shield of faith so you have the whole armor of god the helmet of salvation the breastplate of righteousness the girdle of truth the preparation of the gospel of peace you even but i want you on top of that in addition to that i want you to take the shield of faith i want you to take the shield of faith above all taking the shield of faith wherewith you'd be able to quench all the fiery darts of the devil in ephesians 6 14 to 15 the word having having your loins good about with truth having on the breastplate of righteousness and so on the word having should be noted having brings about the idea that these things are permanent you have it having this do that so you have this first you must have this so these are permanent and these are long-range items so if the soldier found himself in a lull in the battle or in a resting point during the march he does not take off his belt he does not take off his breastplate he does not he does not he does not take off his shoes are you with me these are things that you, you have you must always have as soldiers we should never take off truth the new birth the unity of of god the eminent return of the lord jesus christ you you must never take that off we should never take off the breastplate of righteousness holiness the principles of separation from the world and proper associations and so on never take that off we should never take off the shoes which is your confidence in god that gives you the peace truth holiness and confidence in god are non-negotiable these articles can never be removed regardless of how light the battle gets are you following me but when we go to ephesians 6 16 onwards the word take above all take in the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the devil and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit so the shield the helmet and the sword you take sword of the spirit is the word of god it means it implies that these pieces of armor are to be ready at all times for the soldier to access them easily they are instruments that are not to be laid down and discarded but on the other hand the soldier may rest from having them all the time we as soldiers should have a strength of mind and a perseverance or stick to itiveness about us that we are always remain alert ready to fight remaining in battle there are some of us who constantly need a rededication but that could mean that that we are forsaking some of the of, of our weapons and when you forsake your weapons you're living in too close quarters with the enemy for comfort perhaps you have laid down truth perhaps you have laid down holiness Perhaps you have laid down your confidence in God. None of these portions of warfare could be treated with a lack of commitment. It will take every piece of the armor to get to win this war. Put on the whole armor of God that you'll be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. But let's go a little further into the functions of the shield. Shield of faith. Faith serves as a double protection to the soul there he already has the belt he already has the breastplate he already has the shoes all in all those items could be enough but the shield has been provided as an additional protection the shield of faith hides the soul there and it serves as a door and you know in john 10 jesus reminds us as soldiers that his life that our lives are hid in him he is the door so the first function of the shield 
is to quench the fiery darts of the devil one of the chief functions of the shield is to quench to put out to extinguish all the fiery darts of the devil the darts come from the devil his darts are not from a philosophy from a dream world but from a real devil the arrows that paul is having reference to were actually burning missiles that had been launched by the enemy archer the fire arrows were long shafts that had cloth wrapped tips and then had been those cloth wrapped tips had been dipped into pitch the pitch would create a very hot fire but it had the quality of being a slow burning material so the impact of the arrow would cause the pitch to splatter still burning and igniting other things around it for more destruction that's what the fiery darts are like the first function of the shield was to serve as a protection against the fire of the burning arrows so it's not an accident that the soldiers would soak their shields in water before the battle began and you know even now i just thought of it the water could be the word the washing of the water of the word so soak your feet in the word so when the devil comes with his fiery darts it will bounce off and be quenched this is what jesus did the devil came to him with a dart saying if you're the son of god turn this stone into bread jesus raised his shield and said it is written man shall not live by bread alone the devil took him to the top of a temple and says you know the word of god says that he will give his angels charge over you he will not let your bones your big toe he says yes but it also says you must not tempt the lord thy god so i'm not jumping off even though that's what you're encouraging me to do quenching these thoughts of the devil then he takes him to the top of a mountain he shows him all the kingdoms of the world he says bow down and worship me and i'll give you all of that he says it is written you should worship the lord thy god and him only you shall serve his shield of faith was soaked in the water of the world so that when the darts came they were quenched when those thoughts come they are quenched because your shield is soaked in the water so the water would serve to extinguish the fire of the arrows but the water would also give the letter resilience to the possibility of cracking that is associated with day-to-day -day use so the first function of the shield was to quench the deadly darts of the enemy now you know you when you're in an army you're not fighting war by yourself so the shield was also very strategic as i indicated to you before the shield assisted with the advancement of the troops now, I already established that the shield was a defensive weapon. But we must also realize that the shield could become a very important offensive weapon. And this is a new concept for me because I always saw the shield as a defensive weapon and I only saw the sword as an offensive weapon. But now that I understand that the shield was embossed, I could use it to, as well. Are you understand what I'm saying? So men advancing behind the shields in the ancient days could be dressed as threatening as soldiers in their armored personal vehicles today. They're shielded, but they're deadly. And that's who you are in the enemy's camp. You're shielded, but you're deadly. Now the shields could be placed side by side, as you see in the illustration. And while the other soldiers held their shields in the air to consume the rain of fire, so we're moving together, we're advancing together, we lock in our shields, and we're moving forward. And those behind, they put in their shields up in the air. So that when they're raining fire from above, when we get pressure from the outside, we join together, it is being quenched even from above. The Assyrians were probably the first units to use this shield in such a way. And then the warriors would approach 
holding large shields side by side before and above themselves to get closer to the walls or gates of the city that was being besieged because what happens here is that when they reach to the walls these fellas on top of the walls will bombard them from above that's why they had the shields on top so the only defense against this type of formation was for the besieged city to pour hot oil down upon the advancing army so the shield of faith assists with the advancement of the troops and that's why when we come together as a troop we must come together to hear the word of god because faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of god when you're going through a crisis you come together as a troop and you lift up your shield of faith together above and in front and we advance against the enemy's kingdom jesus said to peter and um sister joyce you know the lord is you know you must always come to church because the lord teaches us line upon line precept upon precept sister joyce was talking about peter and what day that was that was when the wow had the the wow day and wow was not a day and um she talked about peter's confession of who jesus was and jesus says upon this rock i will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it but sometimes you get the impression that the gates of hell can't prevail against it because we hide in behind a rock but that's not the impression i get because he goes further after to say what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and what you loose on earth will be loose in heaven so it's not just that the gates of hell can't prevail against us it is us prevailing against the gates of hell And the shield of faith we're coming to understand is not just a weapon of defense. It can also be a weapon of offense. The shield of faith serves as the faith of the individual soldier. What is meant by the faith in Ephesians 6, 16? Faith is the bottom line of commitment that is embraced by the soldier. Faith means belief in God. Our faith leads us to willingly obey god in, in whatever direction in whatever way his word would lead by the unction of the holy spirit there are many scriptures concerning the believer and his faith in god the underlying theme of the life of the believer comes down to five simple words the just live by faith it does not matter what the circumstances are the just live by faith one must live by faith that god is taking care of all a missionary by the name of john Patton, he worked diligently in in translating scriptures into the native language of the people to whom he was called and he was unable to find a word in their vocabulary for the concept of believing trusting or having faith he just simply had no idea how to convey that message in their dialect and one day while working in his hut a native came running into Patton's office and he flopped into the chair exhausted he said it feels so good to rest my whole weight in this chair instantly John Patton had his definition faith is resting your whole weight on God so faith serves as the faith of the soul here. but there's something else that is important that is another revelation to me God himself is the shield above the absence of fear among the soldiers above their own trust and faithfulness to God stands the faithfulness of God himself that's why the apostle Paul in first Timothy 6 12 talks about the good fight of faith the good fight of faith cannot be fought by any man if the soldier had to rely on his own faith then what about the weak faith of the man in mark 9 24 where he says lord i believe help my unbelief don't we aren't we like that at times are we like that at times or we always have faith that whatsoever we pray for we ask believing we shall receive sometimes you want to believe but you just say lord i believe but help my unbelief so if if she really depended on our faith 
I'm telling you, many times you will not get any victory. The, the faith to which victory over Satan is given is in those who have been born of God. 1 John 5, 4, I told you already says, For whosoever, whatsoever is born of God, overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So God is the shield by which victory is secured. The same shield that Yahweh is asked to take up in Psalms 35 2 is the same shield that the saints are exalted to take up in Ephesians 6 16. There are several scriptures which indicate that God is the shield. We see in 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 3 As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. In Psalms 3, 3, but you are a shield around me, O Lord. You bestow glory to me and lift up my head. God is your shield. So we have talked about faith. We have talked about the shield. We want to close by talking about the deadly darts of the devil. The deadly darts of the devil have the ability to cruelly punish the soul there. He must be on constant guard, always standing. These fiery darts are nothing more than seducing temptations. Once these seducing temptations lodge in the flesh, then the results can only lead to one thing, sin. And sin damages the soldier's relationship with his commander-in-chief. It endangers his rank. It endangers the lives of the soldiers with whom he serves. Your sin doesn't only affect you, it affects us. Remember Achan sinned and the nation lost the war. You have to understand that you're part of a body. In many New Testament passages, the saints are warned that fire can belong to hell and can be a manifestation of the devil. Especially in the book of James. Some of the fiery darts of the devil are impurity, immorality, uncleanness, unchaste living, defilement. There are many scriptures to support that. Selfishness. Too much concern with your own welfare or interests. Having little or no concern for others. Egocentric, self-centered, an exaggerated regard for yourself. Each one of these things are studying themselves. Doubt. To be uncertain in your belief or to be inclined to disbelief to hesitate skepticism lack of conviction or condition of uncertainty even that is a study in itself the bible says that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways let not that man think he shall receive anything from the lord you're like the wave of the sea being, being driven by the wind and tossed doubt is a dart of the devil fear is a dart of the devil but it's dread and timidity, terror, fright, apprehension, a feeling of anxiety and agitation caused by the nearness of danger, evil, or pain. That too is a study. Disappointment is a dart of the devil. A failure in the expectations of something. When you leave unsatisfied, when you leave unfulfilled, disappointment. Some people get disappointed with the church, disappointed with the pastor, disappointed with how something happens and you, you get hurt and you leave. That's of the devil. Lust. A, a, a desire to gratify the senses. Forbidden love. An excessive desire to fulfill the bodily appetite for sex, but not just sex, for power, for position in life. All of that is lost. Greed, covetousness, excessive desire for having and gaining wealth, the desire for more and more, more than what you need or more than what you deserve, avarice. There's a lot of study on that as well. And vanity, any act that is done in vain, worthless, futile, idle, excessively proud of yourself or your own qualities or possessions. An attitude of self-conceit and pride. These arrows rain down continually. And every arrow the devil fires is a lie or a half-truth. And if we believe everything that the devil says to us, 
then we are heading for discouragement we are heading for doubt and we are heading for eventual defeat next week god's willing we will talk about the art of wielding your shield and making the final stand let's bow our heads in prayer